This is the American flag. You've probably seen this iconic star-spangled banner being flown above a government building, a patriotic household, or a sports stadium near you ever since you can remember. If you live in the United States, of course. The idea of this Patriot's pennant being one of the quintessential symbols of the United States of America has been hardwired into the minds of her citizens everywhere. The most updated version of the flag debuted on July 4th, 1960, as the result of a project made by a high schooler, Robert G. Heft. Robert was interested in the idea that Alaska and Hawaii were being considered for statehood, and in 1958 submitted a design of his own to then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Robert's teacher originally gave his project a B-, but conceded that if the flag was accepted by Congress, the grade would be raised. Out of over 1,500 submissions given to Congress, Roberts was accepted, and his teacher, begrudgingly, raised Robert's grade to an A. Ever since then, the red, white, and blue has never changed from its current design, making it the longest standing design for the U.S. flag, with 2020 marking its 60-year anniversary. With such an icon for the U.S. withstanding the test of time, it may not come as a shock to know that an entire section of U.S. code is dedicated to the respectful use and display of old glory. U.S. Code Title IV, Chapter I, The Flag. The flag of the United States shall be 13 horizontal stripes, alternating red and white. And the union of the flag shall be 48 stars, white in a field of blue. When the code was written in July of 1947, Alaska and Hawaii had not been admitted as states to the Union, and ergo, an executive order was later made to amend the addition of the two states. Strangely, a 49-star flag existed for little more than a year before Heft's 50-star design was put into place. Section 4. The Pledge of Allegiance The Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag should be rendered by standing at attention, facing the flag with the right hand over the heart. When not in uniform, men should remove any non-religious headdress with their right hand and hold it at the left shoulder, the hand being over the heart. Later, in the same section, it is stated that military personnel are to render a military salute instead, in or out of uniform. This section of the flag code was added in August of 1998, with the exact wording of the pledge only being codified in November of 2002. Section 6, Time and Occasions for Display. This section is where the physical use and display of the flag starts to be enumerated a bit. Subsection A of these codes states that a flag should only be shown from sunrise to sunset, unless properly illuminated at night. Subsection C states that the flag shouldn't be flown in inclement weather, unless the flag is an all-weather flag. Subsection D lists every holiday on which a flag should be displayed, as well as stating that the flag should be displayed proudly on all days. Hmm. Anyway. Section 7. Position and Manner of Display. Whoa, whoa, okay. This is a lot to digest. Let's cut this down to its most important bits. Ah, much better. <clears throat> the flag of the United States of America should be at the center and at the highest point of the group when a number of flags of states or localities or pennants of societies are grouped and displayed from staves. 
Subsection E describes that the American flag should be most prominent in a group of flags including state or city flags. However, subsection G states that it should not be flown higher than any particular nation's flag. They should remain at the same height in a time of peace. Subsections H through K all state in one way or another that the Union or blue field with white stars should be in the flag's own top right corner or the observer's top left, whether it be on a pole, against a wall, hanging above a street, or displayed in a window. Subsection M covers the many terms and conditions surrounding flying the flag at half-mast, and as such determines the length of time it remains at half-mast depending on who it is commemorating. Section 8. Respect for the Flag One of the most often cited sections of the flag code, this section details all measures that should be taken to show the flag respect as a citizen. In short, the flag should not be displayed with the Union facing downwards, unless in dire distress. It should never touch anything beneath it, such as the floor, the ground, or any body of water. The flag should never be worn as a garment. It should never be used as a cover for a ceiling. It should never be written on, drawn on, or marked with an insignia of any kind. It should never be used to carry anything. And it should never be used as advertising or printed onto anything designed for temporary use and discard. American flag napkins! Get your American flag napkins here! Get them before they're gone! God bless America! With all this being said, there is one more section of flag code that is important to lay out before we continue. Section 5. Codification of Rules and Customs. Definition. The following codification of existing rules and customs pertaining to the display and use of the flag of the United States of America is established for the use of such civilians or civilian groups or organizations as may not be required to conform with regulations promulgated by one or more executive departments of the government of the United States. This one simple clause makes the flag code following it into nothing more than a series of suggestions to be followed rather than punishable law, meaning that everything laid out by sections 6 through 10 are not so much laws as they are, well, codes. You can find all kinds of American flag-based apparel on the internet, and laying a flag on the ground is not punitive so much as it is a sign of general disrespect. But, what about this? Burning the American flag. Some would call it a heinous act. Some would call it domestic terrorism. Some might even call it treason. But the fact remains. Burning a flag that has not been soiled or torn by the test of time is seen as one of the highest forms of disrespect in American culture. Protesters of many of America's systems, both political and economical, have used a burning American flag as a way of bringing more attention to their message. A way of getting a rise out of the most patriotic of Americans. Despite this, burning the American flag is still not punishable to any federal degree, even though some politicians would disagree. So what is the crux of this issue? Why do some people think that burning the American flag should be illegal? How long have Americans been polarized by the good old red, white, and blue? Well, most people would tell you it started with this man. Gregory Lee Joey Johnson, 
Born in Richmond, Indiana in 1956, he grew up in a low-income, racially mixed neighborhood of Richmond most of his young life. Between 1969 and 1973, turbulent family life moved him from Richmond to West Germany, then back to the U.S. where he joined the Merchant Marines and was sent to Panama and Mexico until he eventually moved to Tampa, Florida where he was influenced by and subsequently joined the Revolutionary Communist Party USA. <sighs> Whew. Quite a mouthful. After this point, Johnson moved to Atlanta. He lived there until 1984, where he would set a course to shake up the discourse around the First Amendment forever. August 22nd, 1984. The Republican National Convention is well underway at the Dallas Convention Center. Ronald Reagan, running without opposition, accepts the nomination for Republican presidential candidate with his vice president, George H.W. Bush. Just outside the doors to the center on the streets of Dallas, protesters were marching. They call it the Republican War Chest Tour. A group of anti-war, anti-nuclear protesters who are marching with about a hundred people, and Gregory Johnson is among them. Some are spray painting walls of businesses that they don't agree with. Some are knocking over plants and ashtrays. Some are having die-ins in local businesses. But Johnson has something different in mind. At City Hall, they burned an American flag. Finally, Dallas police surrounded the demonstrators and began making arrests. Johnson went to the steps of Dallas City Hall, poured kerosene on an American flag, and set it on fire. He began chanting political slogans, including Ronald Reagan, killer of the hour, perfect example of U.S. power. While no one was hurt or threatened with injury, Johnson was promptly arrested for violating a state law that prohibited the burning of a U.S. flag. The offense got Johnson convicted of desecration of a venerated object, which sentenced him to a year in prison and a $2,000 fine. Johnson brought his conviction to the Fifth Court of Appeals of Texas, but failed. He then went to the Texas State Court of Appeals, where his sentence was overturned, claiming that Johnson couldn't have been punished for burning the flag. Being vague and inconclusive, the Texas State Court asked the Supreme Court to hear the case. You should be able to have a constitutional prohibition against the desecration of the flag. All right, thank you for the comment. Mr. Yeah. Johnson? Well, if I can respond briefly, a couple of things. One is, he's saying that the flag is a symbol of everything that is good. Well, I think the symbolism is disputed, you know, what the content of that symbolism is. As I the Supreme Court heard Johnson's case with civil rights activist William Kunstler acting as his attorney. The court first asked the question, does the First Amendment protect non-speech acts? The court had made two rulings on other kinds of non-speech First Amendment cases, or symbolic speech, prior to Johnson's case with Stromberg v. California saying that red flags could not be banned as they are symbolic, and Tinker v. Des Moines saying that clothing and armbands couldn't be banned as they too are symbolic. Texas had arrested Johnson for flag desecration, not verbal misconduct, which begged the question of whether or not Johnson's action acted as expressive conduct. The court claimed, Conduct may be sufficiently imbued with elements of communication to fall within the scope of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. They thus found that under the circumstances of Johnson's arrest, Johnson's acts constituted as expressive conduct which would permit him to invoke the First Amendment for protections. The court decided in a controversial 5-4 decision in favor of Johnson. The court's ruling on Texas v. Johnson invalidated state-level laws that banned the burning of the flag in force in 48 out of 50 U.S. states. However, this was not the end of Johnson's flag troubles. Congress, in response to the Texas v. Johnson decision, passed a piece of legislation called the 1989 Flag Protection Act, making it illegal at a federal level to desecrate an American flag. The act was put into effect on October 28, 1989, and on October 30th, 
Johnson retaliated. He accompanied Sean Eichmann, David Blaylock, and Scott Dred Scott Tyler to the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court, where the quartet proceeded to set fire to three American flags, chanting, Burn, baby, burn. The four protesters were promptly arrested and spent the night in jail. The next day, the three men Johnson accompanied, Tyler, Blaylock, and Eichmann, were charged by the state of Texas with violation of the act that had only been certified three days prior, along with disorderly conduct and demonstrating without a permit. No charges were filed against Johnson, claiming that there was insufficient evidence to convict him. Johnson found this to be an outrage, calling it in the Freelance Star a miscarriage of justice. Hmm, great description. In 1990, the consolidated cases of the three men recorded under Eichmann for the Supreme Court were turned into a new Supreme Court decision, United States v. Eichmann, which handed down a ruling on June 11th of that year that struck the 1989 Flag Protection Act out of federal law. And so, Johnson, Eichmann, and every other flag-burning protester were now protected under two federal court rulings and to this day hold the right to burn the flag as symbolic speech. Johnson still occasionally protests with Revolutionary Communist Party USA to this day, burning flags included. But what does this mean for the rest of us? Well, it simply means that no matter what, you cannot be arrested for burning an American flag, period. This might not be what some people would describe as the best form of protest, but it cannot for any reason be punished. And that's okay. We as Americans reserve the right to speak in whatever way we please. We the people have the right to our own opinions, our own viewpoints, our own moral dislikes and self-righteous banter. The First Amendment was written in such a profoundly vague way to protect us in this regard. No matter who you are, you can say what you want to say because of the Constitution. Even if you say it with a burning passion.